Welcome to the Central Reach ABA On Call Podcast. We do insist upon quick reinforcement. Thought-provoking conversation, ideas, and trends in the applied behavior analysis industry. With this type of arrangement of material, you can learn the same amount in about half the time with half the effort. Now here are your hosts, Drs. Rick Abina and Doug Kostowitz. Welcome, everyone, to Episode 8. And today, we're going to talk about two things that we all have a relationship with, ABA and tech. Doug, I was going to say we all love these two things, but while I'm going to go out on a limb and say everyone loves ABA, I don't think the same thing is true of tech. No, and I think that's a good point because people are – hesitant to adopt new things. Change is very difficult, but the cat is out of the bag. Technology is here to stay Mm. and it is becoming integrated with ABA. Yeah. And whether you like it or not, it's just going to get bigger and bigger and you won't be able to ignore it. I mean, let's talk about just some of the tech that you know, we have access to, and, and now is really commonplace. And you know, I'll, I'll try not to engage in you know, showing my age and how old I am, but some of that's going to slip out nonetheless. And you know, for for young guys like you, you don't yeah, know. Yeah, right. I know. I I never had it so difficult <laughs> as you did when you were younger. That's right. Steam engines back then. So what are That's some right. areas? Of, let's just talk about tech in general. What's some tech that you interact with, that I interact with, that everyone who's listening to us would interact with? Well, I think the first thing, and it's taken for granted now, but just the web, the access to information – that we just have. And if you go back 30 years, which is not that long ago, it wasn't there or it was not available and it was not as expansive. That is just amazing right there. I, I'll agree with you. If we're going to start anywhere, the access to the web and the information that people have is astounding. Yeah. Being, uh, I mean, you're probably, you know, you could remember what the development looked like. Like, I remember back when I first started uh, you know, online, my online presence, you know, there was Prodigy, there was AOL, and you know, your, and even like the web browsers, things were just starting to emerge. But now, whatever you want, it, it's overwhelming. You have to be a good consumer of information to figure out how to get to what you want because there's so much stuff. Right. And it's not just the the web, but just think of the computers and computing power, the access to uh, sharing through Google Docs, being able to work at the same time as someone else thousands of miles away, or Excel, just what what that allows you to do now or Skype, being able to talk to each other with many different – an entire team of people working with about an individual can talk remotely from their home. Well, each one of those that you said is almost – it almost requires a conversation, but you know we don't need to go to go there. But you're right. Uh, how many people? Google Docs came after Excel, so Excel, part of Microsoft, and you know where that has gone. Uh, many, I, I would say, when I think about the graduate students that I work with, you know, I mean, most of the time they're always telling me what the new things are. And you know, right. Google Docs, I was brought into that, and now I can't see not using it. But Excel, you know, people know, and some people are really good at it. And Skype, as you point out, mm-hmm. and not just Skype, but there's a lot of other things that are out there. Zoom, uh, people could rattle off their preferred things. And what does this do? What does this technology do? It makes the world a lot smaller. Mm-hmm. You could, you Definitely. could. Uh, you, know, you could reach out to people worldwide. I mean, it's just, it really is mind-boggling to think about how far we've come in such a short period of time. 
back in the day, you know, when you look at where the phone carriers were, if you wanted to call someone that lived in Germany, that was a long distance call and that was very expensive. Do you even have to pay mm-hmm. for that now with technology? No. Yeah. And now think about this. We're carrying it with us. So look at smartphones. That we have the computing power of what we used to have in our pocket. Yeah. And so we can do everything that we're doing and it's mobile. It just goes with us. It's just it, – it's astounding. So you can sit on Skype on your phone at a coffee shop. The smartphones in the power that they have – is out of this world to consider like you know we live in a cycle now where oh what's the new uh, what's the new iphone if you're an iphone user or what's the, you know the new android what's the new you know, whatever your preferred phone is but you know putting this into perspective i was reading a book not too long ago talking about where tech is going and the the author made up a really amazing point about tech and what he said is you know those cards you get that you share with people that like you open them up and they'll they'll sing songs or they'll play things and stuff like that mm-hmm. the oh, yeah. the technology in those birthday cards were more than all the computing technology that people had in World War II in that era i mean wow. it's just when you think about this is you know we as a species we're not talking about going back to when we were in caves we're talking about you know 70 80 years in whatever right. the or even less than that and the smartphones like the cameras i remember that not and again this is within 10 years i used to buy those little Oh, I forget even what they were called, but you could spend like a hundred dollars and you could have a camera that was really good. Who I don't even know that flip, those people flip, s- flip cameras. Yes. I know what they are. They're flip cameras. Flip I still cameras. have one. Who yeah. even wants those anymore? Yeah. Just use your phone, which no, is ten it, times better. Yeah. Right. And that so you're just thinking about technology. It's getting smaller, it's getting faster. We're getting to the point now where we don't even need the phone. You're wearing things. You have those Google glasses for a right. while. They you have I watches. You have you watches. You have me watches. You have huh. everything now that is getting smaller and smaller and doing so much more. Yes, Google Glass is uh, that was the thing, and then because it was so far ahead of its time, it ended up going away. But now it's coming back, and there are many other players in that field and that is going to greatly increase uh, that well i don't it's hard not to to jump all around but where the google glass is going and where a lot of these other glasses are going is with augmented reality augmented Mm -hmm. reality you know there's there's augmented reality and virtual reality you know both of those terms mean reality is what our perception of the external events that are going around us. Augmented reality is when we look through the world, when we look, if you don't have any glasses, that's reality. When you're looking things and experiencing reality. Augmented reality means you put glasses on and your reality is augmented by pictures, by sounds, by whatever you want to augment it with. Whereas virtual reality, that's when you're enclosed in a completely different environment and all of your reality is going to be projected or somehow given to you. And in the Google Glass and the augmented reality, that stuff is happening really quickly. Yeah, it, it's it's amazing. And so much of what you're talking about, what we are discussing, intersects directly with ABA. And it is just amazing how many ways it does intersect that the technology is only getting and that's why when we started this we said change is happening it's going to happen we have to figure out how to address it or you, we're going to have to change with it cuz it's gone and so that's such an important aspect to what you're addressing there yes and there's something else i'd like to point out before we end this section if you were entrepreneurial 
or even if you're not entrepreneurial, even if you're research minded, think about where you can go next. You don't have to be a passive rider in this trip. You can take this and run with it. You, there are so many opportunities that are going to be coming up in uh, with all of this technology. And what I want to see happen is to behavior, I want to see our field of behavior analysis leading the charge in working with people versus just letting other people do this and let's see what happens. So for our next topic, let's dive into the upsides of technology and ABA. And first and foremost, I may be dating myself here, but the ease of information access. I think back to my master's program and was and was still submitting little forms so I'd have to wait a few days for the journal article to be sent to me so that I couldn't cram for my papers the night before. I'd have to start a week ahead of time. Whereas now we can get most of these journal articles at our fingertips. Yeah. Uh, you're bringing back memories of uh, <laughs> when I started in, in college in the mid 80s. And you, know, you had to know the Dewey Decimal System back then. And <laughs> yes. in fact, the big technological innovation was these disks that you would put into your computer. So you had to check out these disks. And the disks were actually, you know, helping you figure out where stuff was. And if you're lucky, you could access a database and there were articles. But now, everything, like if you want to pick up Java, it's right there. If you want to pick mm -hmm. up any of your journals, it's right there. Now, sometimes this, these things are behind a paywall. But most of the right. time, you can just access all of this. And that has so many benefits for the ABA professional because, as you pointed out, here's another thing that has personally affected me. I've gotten rid of like almost all of my books, almost all of yeah, my journals, whereas when I first started out, a badge of honor would be, ooh, look at that person's library. They have all the Java issues. I don't even want all the Java issues now. Yeah. I don't want paper. I want mm -hmm. everything digital. I want to yeah. pull out my iPad, I want to read the latest issue of JAB or Java, and I want it there, and I want it easy, and I don't want digital stuff. Right. And that is huge. And so, And another thing that if I have a question about a certain method or a certain procedure, I just type it into Google search, and I get 35 things, and then I can peruse through exactly what I want, whereas... Thinking back to the searches before, you'd wait two, three, four days to get an article and find out it wasn't what you wanted. It kind of looked good, but it wasn't what you wanted. And so the 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 speed at which you have it, the ease, that is kind of funny because I've been moving offices and I've tossed all my journals away. It you don't need them anymore. You you don't. And you know, to build upon what you're saying, it's not just articles. You can go, if you're on social media, or even if you're not on social media, if you go to YouTube, there are a lot of enterprising behavior analysts, and they'll put up YouTube videos, and they'll show you how to do shaping. They'll show you how to do the, and, there's, and because our field is growing so much, you're getting all of this information, which isn't just journal articles, it's how to do it. And then you can find people discussing things. You can even find... Uh, People are videotaping, like let's say you can't make it to FABA this year and someone videotapes FABA. Now you can see you know, Julie Vargas giving a talk or whomever. It's remarkable yeah. how you can well, have that at your fingertips. That leads us to a really great next point is that is real-time supervision. You can use the internet now, technology, cameras, to supervise remotely. So think about all the, the, the explosion of the BCBA and, and how there's uh, the variety of levels, the BCABA, the registered behavior technician. So you have all this ability to supervise remotely rather than call around in your zip code to try to find somebody that can supervise you. That's a, a very good point. In fact, 
there are many people now that have businesses that like the only time you meet these people in person is maybe you're both at ABAI and mm-hmm. you see them. All right. Uh, it, it's advancing the science of behavior analysis through that technological medium. It's, it's fabulous. The other, not only do we have this crazy growth of BCBAs, but universities now have also grown to meet the demand. And how do universities offer their supervision? Well, they do it remotely. Like I can think of some programs that are huge and they have very strong components where now people can communicate remotely. You know, that, that is exciting and that's happening now. But when I think about some of the upsides of tech in ABA, I like to think about the future and what are we mm-hmm. in what's in store for us. Like let's talk about augmented reality or AR. If this is possible, like you're are you a mechanic? Let me just ask you that. Are you mechanically inclined with your car? Do you mess around with it? Uh, other than I could probably do brakes and spark plugs and okay. basic stuff. Could you take apart an engine? Uh, no, I With could not. With AR, you could have step-by-step. Step. AR says, okay, here's the bolt that you need. Here's the tool that you need. You could literally have AR guide you through taking an, an engine apart. I mean, just think about that. And now think about how will that relate to, you know, when our field really starts embracing AR, what can AR do for people who are new in the field? How can we augment reality to help people be better behavior analysts? Well, I've got some ideas right now. How Let does me that hear sound? Them. No, I, w- I was just thinking you could put these, uh, let's say you have some glasses, you put them on a teacher or someone interacting with, with students and they, you could have reminders for what behaviors to target with whatever your um, plan is. So let's say you're providing some reinforcing stimulus. So it can prompt you to do that when the topographical model in your glasses appear. And yep. it prompts you and reminds you so that you don't get that intrusion of an, another person sitting in the back of the room raising a hand or yelling or, or waving a sign to you. It's real-time prompting for the individual that then could be faded. It almost sounds like you're putting them on a behavior plan that that helps another student or individual with procedural fidelity for their plan. Yeah, there are so many applications like that that are going to grow and whoever is enterprising and whoever is going to start creating these things, there is just an incredible opportunity to think about things that we do now, how do you move that to an augmented reality? But what about virtual reality? What could we do there? Like, do you know anybody doing virtual reality stuff? Uh, You probably do. uh, I probably do. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to throw out any names because I don't want to give credit where credit isn't due and not miss anybody. But I do know that there are some things that individuals can practice teaching, and they are they are watching avatars that are being controlled by. Individuals far, far away, but it they can, you can implement different techniques in interacting with these avatars, which allow pre-service educators to practice those techniques. Uh, there's just so many applications, and we're not limited to just practice. How about data collection? Absolutely, you can te- you can make people really good data collectors in virtual reality. Let's say here's an. Well, okay, let's just go with data collection because I was going to jump off there for a minute. With data collection, if whatever data collection procedure you're using, let's say you're doing, uh, you're recording the be- your, the frequency of a behavior, you could set up virtual reality with either actual people. So you can, there's two ways to do this. You There are special cameras that create the virtual reality effect. And those cameras are very expensive, but... And of course, they're being drove. Uh, the prices being drove down. But those cameras will allow you to experience 
real people, or as you pointed out, you could have someone just create avatars doing stuff, and that could be programmed, and you know what the exact number is, and all of a sudden, rather than lecturing at a university class, everyone puts their goggles on and tries this. Yeah. I mean, it, that, and so that's practice in data collection. And I know we could talk about this for a bunch more, but think about what data we have access to now via technology and wearables. Yeah, we, we really we, haven't talked a lot about that, but you can start correlating stress levels and so on to behavior. Where's that going to take the field? Uh, who knows? I mean, but we have access to so many internal states or as you uh, as we spoke about this is internal economy the vital statistics of individuals you can take your own data and incorporate that or you have somebody else wear that and you can begin to take data on that in addition to these uh, of uh, observable measurable behaviors yeah doug we live in an amazing time and i cannot yeah. wait to see where all of this tech is going to take ABA. Rick, before we go too far, though, I'm going to say, hang on. And that's setting up for topic number three. And that is these potential downsides of technology and ABA. So there's some things that we need to take a step back and think about as we are talking about all the wonderful advancements. And I'm going to throw the first one out. It's near and dear to our heart. We brought it as an upside and it's Excel, but that has a downside too. And we've made that uh, some of our research, we've been working with that, and that is the displays of data that Excel produces. And they don't follow line graph construction rules. And they're proliferating within behavior analysis, special education, and the decisions that are being made may not be the decisions that the data suggest. Yeah. If we contrast the past, which was, and let's go back to 50s and 60s, people would go to someone who would be in drafting, and that is the person that would be doing the graphs. Now, everybody can do them. But they don't necessarily do them properly. It's easy to make a graph in Excel. It's easy and, and journals mostly may accept that or some version of that. And it doesn't produce graphs that follow rules. They don't adhere to the three-fourths rule. They don't uh, place things in proper, place it in its proper perspective. So, and it allows for non-standard linear graphs. Yeah, you know the biggest bugaboo that I have and that I see with Excel is when you create your graph, the horizontal axis, the one, is going to line up with your data, but the damn tick mark is not going to be equal on the one. And if you know how to fix that issue, then you are golden, yeah. but almost nobody right. knows how to fix that issue. Right. Open up a Java, open up whatever graph you want, whatever yeah. journal you want, you're going to see that all the time. Mm -hmm. And you know why that happens? Right. Because of freaking Excel. And I don't know right. why it's like that, but you're right. This Excel, while it has its upside, the downside is when we just trust in technology and when everybody can just form graphs, if people don't understand the rules to form graphs, although you give them the ability to construct a good graph, then you know technology is actually just enabling people to put something together and that thing they're putting together might not be the best. And that's not to say that some graphic program won't adhere to certain roles in the future. Just the current, how, how Excel is everywhere, it's just become that default. And at this point, the default settings within Excel, because you can follow through and make a proper graph using Excel, yes. but the default settings are not there. Yeah. Uh, the next area of hesitation, and I'm gonna throw this out to you is, and, and you're more of the social media guy than I am, but with social media and Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat, we do a lot with working with kids and adults 
in protected statuses. And it's very easy and inappropriate to share videos and pictures without the proper <sighs> consent. And it's so we're, we're in this sharing mode, but understanding that you're breaching confidentiality for these individuals. It's it, it, I'm, I, I'm sure you deal with that with students, pre-service educators. Uh, you have to remind them constantly that you can't just snap pictures, snap videos, yes. and publish and share this. This That's, is inappropriate. Listen, we have dealt with that. I mean, now we have better rules, and I think there's more awareness that there are certain things that you can't do because a lot of people have been – uh, have experienced consequences to that, but I right. can recall, you know, within the past five years, a number of instances where one person took a video and paste, posted it to Facebook, and it just so happened that the supervising teacher was a friend. That person ended up getting kicked out of uh, yeah. doing that student teaching because they violated all of the rules of what the school had set forth. You just can't video kids and then put it up on your feed. I can think of other instances where people have tweeted out photos of you know, like a selfie of like, hey, look at me working with my kid. Well, that's great. And that would be wonderful if you can share that. But you absolutely have to adhere to the confidentiality standards of where you are. And social media is that the presence of it certainly has its downsides. And people mm -hmm. just have to be aware of that. And, and it's important if you have a proper display of some procedure and you want to use this as an exemplar or a non-example, but understanding that it's just because it's easy doesn't mean that it's legal. Yes. And doesn't mean that it's the proper thing to do. So make sure, I'm not saying don't share videos of work, work, working with kids or other individuals. Just making sure that you have to follow those procedures. And so for, you know, the kids, I, listen to me. I'm I'm really dating my the kids today. Those those crazy wacky kids. Make <laughs> sure that you're 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 following the, the established rules regarding confidentiality. Yeah, and well, then um, well while we're well on, then I'm yeah, sorry. I was gonna say no. I was gonna say that. So yeah, we're 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 asking them to do that, but maybe we should be asking the corporations not to. Well, before we go there, a certain, I oh, don't you want, got another. I one. don't want to leave social media yet. Um, oh. what is another issue that I think that I see quite a bit? And because you don't have a big social media presence, you might not uh, have picked up on this, but you probably see this even at a, at a local level at the university. Many people will go to Facebook groups or even not so much LinkedIn, but I'm starting to see it a little bit more there and they will describe a client and they'll say, what should I do? Oh. Think about the problem there. You can't – like if you ask me, even if you you were asking me about something, like well, you could – you and I can talk generally about things, but I can't give you advice about a student you're working with because right. I have no assessment data. I mean it's unethical for uh -huh. us to do these things, but the, the amount of people seeking advice and asking for help is astounding. And – that's okay to need advice. It's the channels you go through. You shouldn't be crowdsourcing an intervention. Yes, that is exactly what I'm trying to say. Well said, Doug. So let's go back to your point so, about corporations. Well, well, now you got me on a topic because I, <laughs> I get emails okay. from my previous students. Let's stay there. And they say, what should I do? Well, yeah. No, I get emails from my previous students. What should I do? And I tell them, number one, you're going to have to tell me X, Y, Z, any, you got to go through every point before I'm even going to give you any advice. So, and then I may say, I can't give you any advice. So th that is a process that you have to follow if you are asking for advice. You can't just go and gather it from the word on the street. So, okay. yeah, or ask your professor who that. knows nothing right. about your kids or what you're doing. Right. Exactly. So, yeah, we, we know the procedures as, you know, when you're when you when you're going to provide advice, you better be providing it from a position of strength, data and 
in your area or yeah. I mean, you have to ethically pass that on to some or, or say you can't provide that yes. information. I, mean, I, okay. I appreciate the students who come to you and the people who are on social media because they may be new to the field and they want help. So they're doing this from a position of wanting to help this person live their life better. And because they might be new and they don't know, but you know, just to put a cap on this conversation, while I love the fact that you are trying to explore or different ways, uh, you know, you might be confronted with if you find yourself in that position, uh, you know, someone like you or I or, your, or our peers saying, you know, we can't necessarily answer that. So, okay, let's move on and talk about where you were going before I kept us with social media, and that is corporations using our data. It's crazy how all the access, like right now, everybody who has a smart phone if you have so you and i have iphones siri Mm -hmm. is always listening if you have you know google if you have any of these things alexa they are always listening what do you think's going on where do you you think's going on with that data on all the talk that we have Mm -hmm. what happens if people are discussing clients and oh well you know siri's listening siri's recording it if there is a breach in that data, who's responsible for talking about client confidentiality? Is it you as a corporation? Because although we all feel comfortable with corporations, the amount of hacking that goes on out there is crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it, we There's so much data that's not protected or just thrown around or collected without our knowledge, even though we've consented to it through one of those 4,000 page monthly agreements that we get with each update. um, There's so much data being collected without our knowledge. Yeah. So it's it. And what are people doing with that? I know I've, I've, heard that Google runs thousands of experiments daily just on searches that people do. They do. That's right. Yeah. So, well, Doug, we talked about a lot of things here. We talked about what is tech that we're all familiar with, what are the upsides and what are the downsides. And if we're going to wrap things up, one thing that's clear, and we said this at the beginning, tech is not going away. And there are going to be really good things with it, and there's going to be really bad things with it. Hopefully, as behavior analysts, we can be part of shaping this technology and helping this move forward and continuing to help people make their lives better. Yeah, I mean, technology is just an extension of the behaviors of individuals. So if we can, like you said, shape the individuals and the technology moving forward, we can make it more positive than negative. That's the end of Episode 8. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate all the downloads, and we appreciate all the shares you've been giving us. Thank you for listening to the Central Reach ABA On Call Podcast with Drs. Rick Abina and Doug Hostowitz. This is verbal behavior and... You can find the show notes for this episode on centralreach.com slash ABA On Call. Please stay connected with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by following at Central Reach and subscribe on the podcast player of your choice. 